and thank you for joining us for our first Seabrain Responder Nationwide Introductory Training. My name is Christine Olson, and I'm a Senior Program Analyst with Chambridge Technologies, which is the contractor for the Seabrain Responder, RAD Responder, and Chem Responder programs. This training is open to all U.S.-based emergency response organizations in order to learn more about the Seabrain Responder program and how you and your organizations can leverage its features and capabilities. We'll be starting today's training with an overview of the Seabrain Responder, RAD Responder, and Chem Responder programs before we hear from our current users on how they've implemented the program across their organizations. After that, we'll cover the basics of Seabrain Responder, and how organizations and events work in the system. And we'll then highlight some RAD responder and CAM responder specific features. So with that, I will hand it over to our FEMA Seaburn Office program managers to introduce the RAD responder and CAM responder programs. My name is James Blaze, and I'm the program manager for RAD responder at FEMA. And it is our mission to help equip state and locals with tools uh, that they can take charge of and respond to, recover from, and be a more resilient community at large. Um, if uh, just as you will learn through this training, uh, this in, this entire system has been driven by state and locals. It is what state and locals want that gets into the system, and the improvements that are made are driven by you. So as you're going through this training and you're thinking about things that you would like in the system, um, you know, make sure you jot those babies down and send them to our support email and, uh, and we can work on that. Thank you so much and I will pass this on to Dante. Thank you, Jim. Um, my name is Dante Steller. Uh, I work with Jim in the FEMA Seaburn office and I'm the program manager for the chem responder uh, portion of the Seaburn responder uh, network. Um, thank you all off the top for, for being here today, especially our guest presenters. It will be nice to hear from them and their, their usage of the system. I think that'll be great information for our audience today. Chem Responder is uh, the sister program, if you would, to Rad Responder. Um, Rad Responder was the fir first out the gate, and Chem Responder came along about two years ago in response to um, feedback from the user community, as Jim said, and, and a signal demand for a similar capability within the chem realm. So uh, we embarked on that about two years ago, uh, it's been a great success so far. The system continues to be built out uh, based off of feedback from our end users, uh, such as yourselves. So really excited to see where we're going from here. I think um, the, the system itself has great potential uh, in, in aiding the first responder community. And we look forward to hearing feedback as far as capabilities and, and ideas in the future. So like Jim said, please feel free to forward those to us. And with that, I will turn it back over to our Chambridge team to um, lead us through the presentation. Thanks, Jim and Dante. So now I'm going to hand it over to Brendan Palmer, who will give a presentation on what Seaburn Responder is and how it came to be and some of its current capabilities and features. Thanks everyone for your time uh, and attention today. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the origin uh, of Seaburn Responder, where it came from, uh, and uh, what the current status of the program is now. Seaburn Responder uh, is a free capability provided to uh, federal, state, local, territorial, tribal organizations with equities and some type of Seaburn preparedness uh, and response. Uh, Seaburn Responder, uh, which launched in July of 2019, uh, is a multi-hazard data sharing uh, and data management capability. Uh, it is comprised of RAD Responder, CAM Responder, Bioresponder, uh, and a IMAC, Interagency Modeling and Atmospheric Assessment Center portal. RAD Responder, which was the first hazard portal uh, to be developed by the FEMA Seaburn office, uh, that will eventually comprise Seaburn Responder. Uh, RAD Responder was uh, conceived after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant disaster in Japan uh, in March of 2011. Uh, a number of lessons learned were generated regarding data sharing, uh, being able to communicate critical information, establish a common operating picture, and maintain situational awareness during a uh, radiological emergency. As a result, the FEMA Seaburn 
uh, office uh, in partnership uh, with Department of Energy and others uh, started to create the capability uh, to again provide uh, capability and add capacity to state and local organizations. Uh, this is our timeline uh, for where we began and where we are now in terms of the CERA responder network. Rad responder was actually released uh, in spring of 2013 uh, after a couple of years of development after Fukushima Daiichi. It had been around for a few years prior to uh, 2016 where the system became codified uh, as the national standard and whole community solution for the management of radiological data. Uh, it is codified within the NUCRAD uh, Nuclear Radiological Incident Annex uh, to the Response and Recovery Federal Interagency Operational Plans. Uh, the NUCRAD Incident Annex uh, basically uh, dictates that the system shall not be turned off, that it shall remain available uh, to the whole community to support uh, radiological and nuclear preparedness and response. In 2018, after the success uh, of RAD Responder, uh, the RAD Responder program had proliferated substantially. Uh, we had a number of users, particularly hazmat organizations, civil support teams, uh, departments of health and environment, uh, were interested in the ability to uh, leverage the uh, chem chemical portion of their portfolio in a similar system to RAD Responder. Uh, so a sister system was launched, uh, Cat Responder, in fall of 2018. As I mentioned in July, we integrated these capabilities under a common umbrella network called Seaburn Responder. Uh, and that is where we are today. If you have a RAD Responder account, you, that means you have a Seaburn Responder account. Uh, you can, your organization can be a single hazard within Seaburn Responder or multi-hazard. Uh, and determining the different hazard types you have access to will allow you to collect and maintain uh, that particular hazard class data. While Seaburn Responder is a uh, network uh, comprising organizations from across the community, the business model is also a network approach uh, where uh, this the uh, primary funding source uh, and sponsor is FEMA through the FEMA Seaburn office, uh, but it's not limited to FEMA. Uh, it is a uh, truly uh, uh, integrated approach uh, with organizations like the National Nuclear Security Administration under the Department of Energy, the National Urban Security Technology Laboratory under the Department of Homeland Security, um, Office of Radiation and Indoor Air uh, with the EPA, uh, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency under DOD, uh, are all funding sponsors uh, of Seaburn Responder. And then we also have organizations that act as shepherds. Uh, they have large constituent groups. They help uh, identify requirements for the evolution of the, of the system and help us to proliferate the capability among uh, their representatives. So the National Association of City and County Health Officials, Conference of Radiation Control Program Directors, uh, and others, uh, all representing kind of a common network approach uh, to pro proliferate Seaburn Responder. So we start with a blank slate uh, within the system. Uh, prior to collecting any data, uh, you're able to manage field team operations. Uh, and that uh, includes managing uh, equipment. So we have a very robust equipment inventory uh, capability in the system, managing personnel, uh, allocating particular roles and responsibilities within the system, uh, and then being able to assign those personnel and equipment to specific field teams that can then be uh, deployed or dispatched, uh, provided assignments where they can collect data. And then uh, with uh, certain permissions enabled, you can track those responders to see where they are, where they have been. Um, you can also maintain um, kind of a, uh, a work of protection uh, over their uh, on the RAD side for dosimetry for emergency response purposes. Uh, and being able to see that in real, in near real time uh, has been value added in terms of maintaining situational awareness and accountability uh, for personnel. Additionally, you can maintain facility information. Uh, facilities in a Seaburn Responder uh, can, can be a uh, radiological facility, like a nuclear power plant, where you then associate a number of sampling locations. Uh, they can also be chemical in nature. Uh, so if you've got a number of uh, chemical facilities uh, where you might need to maintain tier two type data, points of contact, documents, and that can also be captured in uh, Seaburn Responder 
again, to kind of maintain situational awareness for responders to understand what hazards exist in their area of operation. The CBER responder mobile applications uh, have evolved from simply kind of a, a data collection tool, uh, a more util utilitarian approach uh, for mobile applications have evolved based on user feedback and requests so that you can now maintain more situational awareness on the mobile application. So being able to see more data points, facilities, other responders uh, on your mobile application map uh, to search and look for facilities on your mobile app. Uh, and again, be able to see particulars of those facilities such as chemicals uh, and descriptions and locations of them. So it might be slightly hard to see here, but you can see we've got some personnel uh, location icons here, uh, and we haven't even committed, commenced uh, the data collection piece. Um, so we're, we're in the uh, organization phase, the planning phase, and part of that planning phase uh, begins with um, GIS files, right? So predictive modeling, uh, other type of uh, geo shapes that can be leveraged for operational planning purposes. Uh, Seaman Responder uh, supports the the upload uh, and display of standard GIS files like KML, KMZ, or shape files. Uh, you can take some of these files as outputs from you know, the ERG application, uh, Aloha, or DITRA products uh, and incorporate them. They could be dispersion type modeling, they could be, you know, represent critical infrastructure or weather. Uh, as long as they're a standard GIS file, we can generally accommodate them. Uh, and just kind of showing what it looks like for our KML architecture. Uh, what we're showing here uh, is an event that has a lot of data. We can also overlay the GIS files. These are provided from the Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration, uh, where uh, you can view not only the modeling and the contours, but also PDF reports that can accompany uh, as part of the uh, KMZ architecture. So uh, the briefing products can accompany a, uh, a KM, KML or KMZ, providing uh, amplifying information regarding that particular uh, file. Another important capability that's coming very soon is the IMAC portal. Again, the Interagency Modeling and Atmospheric Assessment Center uh, that is uh, stewarded by the FEMA Seaburn office, uh, but also uh, technically led and supported by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, supported by Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration, NOAA, EPA, and others. Uh, the ability to provide a single point uh, of distribution uh, of federal dispersion modeling. Uh, so essentially, the single federal, federal model that will be used to support state, local, other types of responses. Uh, through the IMAC portal, you'll be able to request some of these models uh, for exercise and training purposes. You'll also be able, uh, be, uh, be able to access information for how to activate IMAC during an emergency. Uh, so we hope to get this out uh, so folks can uh, gain a little more awareness of what the IMAC capability is, how it integrates with CBER and Responder, and hopefully how it can benefit uh, planning and response efforts for uh, training and emergencies. So you can see here now we've got uh, some personnel locations and uh, a model. Now we start collecting data. So a variety of capabilities to uh, collect data. One of the major important values of CPR Responder is the ability to uh, collect and aggregate data from a variety of sources. So we have kind of a bring your own uh, device approach. Uh, we provide mobile applications, uh, RAD responder, chem responder, soon to be um, a CBRN responder, which unifies the disparate mobile applications to a, to a single uh, mobile application uh, that can be used for RAD, chem, and future bio. You can also upload uh, data directly from the website. So organizations that do not have smart devices or can't access mobile applications can use the website to collect data. Uh, you could have personnel in the field with radios calling back to a central location where that data can then be uploaded. We also integrate fixed monitoring capabilities um, from a variety of different sources. Uh, so we've got what are known as application program interfaces or APIs to integrate different applications uh, that support uh, fixed monitoring. So you can see that uh, in real time through the CBIN responder network. And just some examples of those here, uh, starting with the, uh, the DITRA, Defense Threat Reduction Agency, uh, integration of their IMS, uh, the uh, International Monitoring System uh, to monitor uh, for uh, radiation, radionuclides uh, are here. 
Uh, we've also integrated EPA's RADnet, which is a national network of uh, radiation detection capabilities uh, that are distributed across the United States that can be accessed here uh, in Seaburn Responder. And these can also be done on a case-by-case -case basis. We've worked with states like New Jersey, for example, that have integrated their fixed detection capabilities uh, among their nuclear power plants. We also are working to integrate Bluetooth-enabled equipment. As detection equipment becomes more sophisticated with telemetry integrated, uh, such as Bluetooth, we can now use what I mentioned, the APIs, to integrate this. So a user can swing a PRD, swing a meter that talks to a manufacturer's uh, mobile application. That mobile application can then send that data to Seaburn Responder. And you can determine uh, the, the parameters for how that data uh, gets sent to Seaburn Responder or if it gets sent to Seaburn Responder. But again, another capability to quickly uh, integrate uh, collection resources and aggregate data. Uh, as, again, technology advances through uh, mobile systems, whether it's vehicles or UAVs or backpacks, these capabilities that can collect a large volume uh, of data, uh, gamma readings, uh, spectrophiles, neutron counts, uh, all these types of various data and, and a lot of data, uh, a lot of data very quickly, uh, instead of having thousands of points uh, over a very small area, which makes it hard to, to view, to consume, you can use these kind of tracking paths to identify areas that might be above a threshold that you've identified, and then you can use that uh, for further investigation uh, with other equipment and personnel. So mentioning the APIs, uh, this is how the APIs work. You have a manu equipment manufacturer uh, that has the equipment and it has the application. Their equipment talks to their application. Their application then talks to the Seaburn Responder application program interface, uh, essentially a middleman where uh, the agreed upon data from both parties, the manufacturer and the Seaburn Responder network, can receive that data uh, through Wi-Fi, cell, or satellite, and then that data can be sent to the particular event in Seaburn Responder. Uh, it's a safe and effective way to integrate uh, applications uh, to better aggregate data. And I mentioned uh, new capabilities for high volume data. Uh, that's something that's, that's relatively new. We've done a partnership with, with uh, the National Nuclear Security Administration uh, and FEMA to accommodate users of this equipment. Uh, and as camera responder capabilities continue to evolve, uh, integrating new chemical gas detection capabilities uh, is also new. We've got a, a, a significant number of rat radiation uh, manufacturers or radiation uh, data collection capabilities uh, chemical uh, data collection in terms of their telemetry is coming online and that, that inventory is growing. So data gets collected, uh, you also have the ability to approve or assess that data. Uh, we have evolved the capabilities so that it's multi-layer multi assessment so you can customize how your organization approves data uh, and how you share that data with other partners. Uh, so it's a more nuanced process that was informed by our users uh, that has been released uh, over the last few months. We have also uh, uh, enhanced significantly our lab analysis capabilities. So we cover the life cycle from sample collection uh, to uh, sample control uh, and management all the way through the uh, lab analysis uh, results or analytical results that can then be pushed back into the system. So you can see here now we've evolved from uh, having personnel and equipment ready, the modeling, uh, the operational planning aspect to data that starts getting collected and it starts getting assessed. Uh, and now you have a number of organizations that could exist on a single event, uh, establishing a common operating picture. And that's really the primary pillar of Seaburn Responder. Uh, a lot of organizations can collect data, a lot of systems are out there that can collect data, the big challenge is, is sharing that data when necessary, right? So determining with who and under what context data is shared is critical uh, for decision-making. As any major Seaburn incident will require multiple jurisdictions to be involved, so to be able to quickly collect, uh, share that data to make informed decisions to protect the health of the public and the quality of the environment is paramount. And so establishing these kind of default partnerships in advance uh, where 
fire and police can establish a partnership and determine the parameters for how they will share data in emergencies or trainings or exercises or health departments, local health departments to state health departments, uh, federal resources that can be accessed uh, in terms of partnerships so that you cut down the response time, you cut down the time it takes to consume data and make decisions and you more quickly establish that common operating picture uh, to achieve situational awareness and again to enable effective data informed decision making. A, a recent use case uh, was the state of New Jersey uh, did some background monitoring this year. Uh, we did a nationwide drill, something that we do quite often to create opportunities for low cost uh, exercise and training to maintain proficiency in the system. Uh, New Jersey uh, uploaded uh, over 26,000 measurements. Uh, these are folks moving around the state, collecting this data. Uh, you can see the type of volume uh, that was collected here. Uh, this was, I think we had 11 responders uh, where they could see their tracking paths of all their responders, where they were, where they have been relative uh, to the data collection process. Then they were able to approve uh, the majority of these and then identify those surveys that didn't meet their um, data quality objectives uh, and were able to reject some of those surveys as a result. And that uh, this is a, a fantastic example of being able to train and exercise uh, in a steady state environment to prepare for a worst case scenario. Just a couple different use cases. Uh, obviously, nuclear power uh, is a uh, is kind of a standard uh, early adopter uh, in terms of the state use. So, a lot of uh, radiological emergency preparedness organizations around the country on the state side started adopting rad responder to be able to prepare for uh, and conduct uh, nuclear power plants evaluated exercises. Um, and we've started uh, also onboarding a number of utilities as well. So we've seen in, in increased use and interest in the system, again, establishing kind of that whole community uh, response capability. We had an interesting uh, use case out in Chernobyl uh, this year where we had some university folks, I believe from Idaho, uh, that went out uh, to Chernobyl to do training and monitoring where they used RAD responder. Uh, they were U.S. personnel operating in a, uh, a foreign country, uh, collecting data, and now that they have this data it is preserved, it will not be removed, they will have access to this data and this event into perpetuity. We also uh, support uh, you know, different types of uh, special security events or national special security events. Uh, FDNY does a number of those, Department of Energy, National Nuclear Security Administration does a number of those. Uh, the ability to use uh, CBER responder in various use cases uh, we found uh, has been in increasing uh, as different organizations adopt uh, and start putting it uh, to, to use for their purposes. Uh, a lot of real world monitoring events over the last couple of years you can see here. Uh, again, these are kind of special events that get used um, uh, by state, local, federal organizations using the CBER responder network. Let's see here. Uh, okay, so we've also got a number of recent and upcoming innovations. Uh, the system is constantly undergoing uh, development uh, where we enhance uh, and improve the system based on user feedback. The more organizations that use it, the better the system becomes because we get that feedback. Uh, and we have a change review board established uh, with our uh, steering group members, um, as we mentioned earlier in that uh, network slide. So uh, we can take requirements, we can vet them appropriately, and then incorporate them. We do that very quickly uh, so that we can make sure that the system is working for the, the personnel, the organizations that need it. Uh, this is our indoor data collection capability. So in GPS denied environments, indoor, underground, the ability to, uh, to create a facility and add floor plans uh, and add metadata uh, for indoor use. So you could upload a picture, an image, right? It could be a, a nice floor plan like this, it could be a picture on the back of a napkin where you can then overlay data. Uh, you can move that data around, you can transfer data from one floor plan to another now. You can use your mobile app, take a picture of a, um, uh, a floor plan and then upload that to the event. 
and now you you can start collecting data against um, a floor plan or an image for indoor use where you might have a GPS denied environment. We're also doing simulation. Uh, on the RAD side, we've been doing a lot of work uh, with um, Department of Homeland Security Science Technology to evolve our simulation capability. So uh, users will be able, soon be able to select from a library of uh, simulation scenarios, RDD, nuclear power, IND, et cetera, run them, uh, put in certain parameters, wind direction, location uh, of the release point, and then uh, users with their mobile apps can download that simulation very quickly. And as they move around in real time and in real space, they will get readings based on the scenario that was run. And so then it will effectively mimic uh, to high fidelity, uh, high scientific and technical fidelity, uh, the simulated readings for uh, one of these scenarios. Uh, so uh, that is still evolving. We're very excited about getting that out. We hope that it improves how organizations uh, train and prepare for these types of emergencies. Uh, we talked about situational awareness on mobile. So being able to better accommodate GIS files on mobile. So shape files, KML files, to be able to see them on your mobile map. Uh, it's something that is uh, a recent capability that we continue to evolve to, again, to add more situational, situational awareness capabilities in mobile uh, to put that kind of in the palm of the hand of the responder. And one of our, our big projects coming up is bioresponder. Uh, uh, we have, we've been gathering requirements. We are moving towards a early concept that we want to vet with our users uh, and people interested in bio collection, whether that is you know, pandemic or emergency response uh, type uh, of bio response focus. Uh, we're, we're still evolving that, but we look forward to any feedback uh, that users or personnel on this webinar might have. And I, we talked about iMac, again, the ability to uh, request models uh, to access a reachback capability uh, for dispersion modeling at the federal level uh, is here. And we hope that uh, by the integration of, of iMac into CBA Responder, it does improve awareness of iMac as a capability uh, because it is a significant one uh, that we want to socialize among uh, other federal, state, local, territorial, and tribal partners. Okay, uh, so this is Seaburn Responder Network. Uh, again, uh, collect, it is uh, encompassed by RAD Responder, Chem Responder, Future Bioresponder, and the IMAC portal. And you can see, we'll get into some of these details here uh, soon about the difference between mobile applications and website, uh, but the, the ability to maintain situational awareness from the web website, the ability to collect data, transmit data, uh, and track responders on the mobile side uh, is a critical one, and you guys will get exposed to that very quickly um, so that you can see the different tools that are available uh, that comprise the CBRN Responder Network. Uh, and we also, uh, through the, the FEMA initiative of trying to solve a knowledge management problem within the community, uh, a one-stop shop of uh, Rad nuke, chemical, and other resources that are available. So uh, standard operating procedures, national level policy and guidance, decision support tools, all these things can also be found in our resource library. Uh, finally, 24, hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there's an emergency, emergency uh, support hotline that is accessible uh, for any critical real world operations or any large scale interagency exercises where folks need some support. We'll hand things over to our power users. So folks who have been using RAD Responder, Chem Responder, and Seaburn Responder over the years, and how they've utilized and adopted the programs in their region, in their organization, or in some cases, even across their entire state. We'll start with the state of Iowa. We'll then hand things over to Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, Contra Costa County, California, state of Connecticut, and the Fire Department of New York City, FDNY. All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity to share uh, information to the new user group here. Um, hopefully, uh, you guys have seen all of the great things that Rad Responder and Chem Responder uh, can do uh, for you, uh, and and it does uh, offer a lot of options. Uh, so, what I was hoping to talk a little bit about is how we sorted through those options 
a bit and tried to narrow down because uh, there's so many amazing things that we could do. We just can't do them all at once. And so I want to just talk through how we got ourselves set up. Uh, some of the things we had to think about as a new organization. So those of you that are new to the system altogether and are setting up your organization, I wanted to speak to that just a little bit. Um, and then just give you a few um, uh, visuals of how we use the system most routinely and some tips and tricks for how to approach your integration of the system or you as a user and in integrating into your organization. So in Iowa, we early on um, determined that we wanted to handle our organizations uh, and our partnerships a little bit differently uh, than the typical uh, sharing. And the reason for that is because in Iowa, particularly for our nuclear power plant response, uh, we function under a radiological emergency preparedness program, and we share amongst many agencies the various aspects that we need to bring to bear when we do a nuclear power plant response. And so, for example, in Iowa, we have Homeland Security Emergency Response Department that does our rep planning, our, D our IDPH, radiological health, which is where I'm at, does dose assessment, technical advisement. And then we pull our field team members from our two universities, the State Hygienic Laboratory, and we also have a radiochemistry lab at the State Hygienic Lab. So rather than trying to make partnerships among us when we all play together under one umbrella, we decided to make one organization uh, called Iowa Rep. So following, so that's how we started with the RAD responder system way back in 2015. Uh, we started to function under that umbrella, and as we tried to work toward bringing on more users across Iowa for other types of radiation response, uh, we started to follow this similar um, aspect. And so we now also have an Iowa hazmat team organization. And as we bring on different hazmat teams, uh, we start to have them nestled under this one organization. Now, with that, everybody can keep their own organizations to do things under their own hat, but when they're functioning under our radiation response plans, uh, we have them functioning under these, these groups. And mostly that helps, uh, especially if you have a limited number of people who will be the administrator of the systems. Uh, so, for example, in our hazmat teams, I do a lot of the admin functions for keeping up equipment, keeping up personnel, uh, and the procedures and policies for how we're going to use the system. And so rather than just going into five different organizations, I can go into one organization and do all the administrative stuff, and everybody's uh, items are all nestled under there. So for example, uh, we have uh, several of our hazmat teams that we've done training with and practiced with, um, and then our Iowa DOT MVE, or Motor Vehicle Enforcement, is also under our hazmat teams group because it's possible that they would be the first ones on scene the first ones to respond and, and start to build out. Um, once that happens, then we would start to leverage our partnerships with our other agencies within the state as well as in our region and nationally. So this is just kind of a visual of that. Um, all of the arrows in orange, which you can't read the words, are all of those that I just, if, if we would keep all of those organizations independent, uh, we would have all those organizations feeding into a radiation incident when we already have plans that bring us together. Uh, and then all of the darker uh, colored uh, gray arrows are our partners like DOE RAP or EPA or FERMAC or states that are neighboring us. Um, and so by bringing our organizations together in this kind of predetermined way, uh, we are able to narrow down who we're sharing with. And so we're only managing one or two organizations at any given time from our state perspective and then we're able to share across other agencies again within our state or our region or nationally. And so my, my point here really is to just think about how you function within your jurisdiction, what makes sense for you. Uh, you know, if it makes more sense that every agency you're working with wants the ownership of their own account, then it probably makes sense to do the partnership as it's kind of presented. Um, but if for some reason you all work together and you all want to use one agency as the lead agency, this might be a solution for you. So as far as using the system itself, once we're kind of uh, starting an event and going forward, we use many of the capabilities and, and we bite off small pieces and update our procedures as new functionality and technology advances. Uh, and so, but fundamentally, the most important thing that Rad Responder does for us is gives us situational awareness across all of our entities and really rapidly. So this is an example of an exercise that we've done 
um, and participated in um, as Iowa, although you'll notice this isn't Iowa's uh, background, but we, we did participate in this. And one of the things that we can do, you can see that the yellow um, kind of blob on the screen is, is really our model that predicted where we should potentially take a protective action. And then we set the thresholds, which you're going to learn about later today in the system, to correlate with what we think would be the same field reading um, that would kind of represent where that, that would be um, as far as a protective action being needed. So if we saw only the models to begin with, because we didn't have anybody on the feet in the field, um, you know, we may take a fairly small swath of the area to do a protective action recommendation, such as sheltering or evacuation. But as soon as field data started to come in, you can see that by having the threshold set, we can really rapidly see, oh my goodness, we have read out much further than we were initially thinking from the model. So maybe we have an ass assumption in our model that's off or we didn't put enough uh, uh, potential exposure into what we were thinking initially and know that we need to quickly make some adjustments. So having the ability to overlay those GIS models uh, and being able to see what we're projecting overlaid with the uh, data that's coming in really gives us that rapid ability to see what's happening and start asking a lot of questions and briefing a lot of people. The other thing that it does is helps us communicate with our field staff. So in this example, uh, we're using the overlay of where we think that, that we might need to um, do sampling for agricultural or longer term assessment. And the green uh, circles that you see out here are areas where we assigned our field teams. So we asked our field teams to go to those farm locations or whatever they correspond to on here. Uh, and inside those ass assignments, we can dictate what kind of sample we want them to take, uh, how many we want them to take, and, and they can log all of that in there. Um, and it helps us to keep all of that together. So if we're watching what's happening and wondering how is sampling going or where are teams going, we can open this up and we can really see uh, the bigger picture in line with other models and, and field data and everything that might be in the system. And again, if we have our partnership set up, uh, we can also see what our partners are doing so that we don't send a team to the same location and uh, duplicate efforts. So in the event that we don't have uh, the ability or have things set up, uh, the drawing tool feature is actually really powerful in the system as well. Um, so I would implore you to think through how you might use the drawing tools, especially if you have a really short turnaround to get some, some visual aid pulled together. Uh, so for example, here we used uh, we didn't we didn't have a quick ability to get an actual plume model into Rad Responder, um, so we just kind of drew where it looked like it was based off of our other computer screen, uh, and we could use that as our projected plume. And you can see that we labeled it as that. Um, obviously, we would work to get the actual plume in, but if somebody's chomping for some sort of a briefing or really wants uh, a information right now. Uh, you don't have to wait, you can use the drawing tools. And then you'll also see some cars, uh, the car icon. Uh, before the assignments feature was available, uh, we often, and we still we'll still do sometimes, um, leverage the use of that point icon uh, by having it look like a car so we can see where our field teams are set to do their trajectory of either sampling or surveys. And then you can see that there are some of the blue cars over on the right that have field readings over top of them. So when they get to the point, we see that a data is there. We can see that they've been to the point. And, uh, and then we can see that, oh, the utilities three and four, either they're not there yet or they haven't put their data in yet. So it's really a great way for us to see what's happening out in the field and make those adjustments accordingly. And then uh, finally, you know, while we have the responders out and about, we can see where they're going. So we can track their path. We can see if it looks like they're heading into the plume or somewhere we don't want them to be. Or if we have an area of interest and we see they're going to be tra traversing that area, uh, we can have them stop and take a sample for us. So again, uh, some of that live information uh, with, and, and then with the new dosimetry feature, uh, we can actually take into account some of the dosimetry based off of their tracks here as well. And then as uh, I think Brendan had mentioned, uh, there's the ability to do other types of measurements. And so in Iowa, we're working on logging our background measurements. Uh, and so we're we're working on just having people carry their equipment, practice getting it out, put background measurements in. Uh, and so 
twofold, gets everybody out practicing, but also uh, gives us background measurements across the state. So we continue to work on that and uh, get, get our basis set here in the system. And then, so RAD Responder we've been using for quite a while, since, like I said, 2015. Um, Chem Responder came around, and uh, we started to explore that with the Iowa Hazmat Teams organization, because that's really where uh, we have the multi-hazard uh, capabilities that exist with the Iowa DOT and our Hazmat Teams themselves. So we've been exploring that and been able to leverage the familiarity of RAD Responder and Chem Responder in the buttons and the look and the feel and the functions uh, to really uh, par down our training that we need to do on how the mobile app works, how the website app works. Uh, and so we're working on training and exploring our use cases and looking for opportunities to uh, grow in the use of ChemResponder as well. Uh, and having the shared Seaburn uh, access, I think, will help with that as well. So there's only one login to get into both systems. So I think, you know, really, if you walk away from this training today, you're going to have so much information. Uh, but, you know, I think getting the most out of the Seaburn responder system, whether it's RAD responder or chem responder, uh, I really recommend that you do the pre-work to get your equipment entered, keep them updated, and to include efficiencies in some of the metadata. It seems like a lot of work. It seems like a lot of effort. But uh, the Chambridge team will help upload from spreadsheets. There's many ways for you to get that in. But I really recommend doing that because that is not what you want to be doing in an exercise. And also with personnel permissions, you know, think through who's going to be responding with you, who's going to be in your organization, and how do you want those personnel permissions to be. Um, and then to, you know, the rest of these um, are, are really helpful in that situational awareness. If you think through your data thresholds for different types of events, it's going to help you see things on the map much faster. Um, and you can train to that so everyone understands what those colors mean in certain situations. And then you can uh, assess those data that are coming in, and you can set up your uh, thoughts on that. So now with some new assessment policy options that we have, uh, you can actually have multiple layers of assessment, and uh, it really helps you trust that data as it comes in on the map. And again, uh, you know, if you have data coming in and you have it being assessed per your plan and everyone knows what their expectations are, you can more rapidly use that data that's coming in from the field. And then one of the strongest things is the map feature. Uh, it really is a powerful tool. Uh, you know, your GIS systems will be able to do a lot of this as well, but when everything's coming into this shared system, you can we'll pull this map up and you can do so many things on the fly to just get the information out. And then GIS can take it and make an official map or take make the you know bigger uh, picture to go out to the media. But when you're standing in a meeting or in a you know tailgate, you can pull this up and you can have this. Uh, you know, out in front of everyone right away. But really, establish those procedures and stay proficient. You've got to practice. You've got to keep those procedures up. I really recommend that you guys work on that. And once you get established, it's really not that that much um, effort. So again, just kind of some key tips for implementation. Determine your best organizational structure. And if you're just a user going into your organization, understand your organization uh, structure. Um, and then establish those critical partnerships. Um, try to learn and stay proficient with the features. Pick some of the features. You don't have to know all the features. You don't have to implement all the, the features at once. Pick the ones that are most important to your organization. Focus on those and then go to the next round and just continually uh, integrate pieces um, as you are able to digest them. And then keep up on your organization management to be prepared for those incidents. And one final slide that I have is just a radiological operations support specialist, kind of a plug here for that group of individuals. Um, they are uh, radiation subject matter experts that are being trained and typed across the nation. Again, it's another program out of the FEMA Seaburn office. Um, and they're able to assist with all types of radiation incidents. And in RAD Responder, you can see a list of the ROS. And on the map, you can see where they're located. And we're hopefully, hopefully going to be training more people um, to be ROS. But we are training them to be familiar with RAD Responder. It's one of the things we train them on and, and practice with. So if you have a, a ROS in, in your jurisdiction, um, you could leverage them to help you with some of these things um, to help write procedures and establish uh, how you want to use a system in your jurisdiction. And I think that's it. So if you have questions for me or how we did things in Iowa or about the ROS program, feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks.
My name is Ben Herskowitz. Um, I'm representing actually two organizations. Um, I'm representing the uh, County of Lancaster's Emergency Management Agency. Uh, I'm the radiological planner there. I manage the response to uh, now one power plant. Previously, it was two, uh, but TMI has since entered a permanently defueled state. Uh, but I'm also representing uh, the county's hazmat team, uh, where I'm the chief of the department, and of course my job there is just to, you know, lead the organization. Uh, both organizations had an interest in RAD Responder at about the same time, following sending a bunch of folks down to the Center of Domestic Preparedness, and then our state bringing in um, Chambridge to do like a big, a big training day. And uh, we said this is something we absolutely uh, solves a lot of problems instead of having six different computer systems to manage it, bringing it all together in one. So both organizations jointly adopted Rad Responder in uh, in July of 2019, and then we were able to be uh, considered Rad Responder ready, which is a great program to just go make sure you're going through all the right steps, have a have Chambridge and FEMA basically say yes, you are familiar with the program. Uh, enough to earn your check mark, so to speak, and it helps to keep you honest. They'll contact you every every year or so and say, hey, we need to see some updates, see some things like that. Uh, we also adopted, uh, the HAZMAT team adopted ChemResponder as well uh, in, in October of 2019. So we use it in two ways. The County Emergency Management Agency uses it quite extensively for asset uh, uh, management within the organization. So we have a, a, a if you're not familiar with Pennsylvania, uh, we are a constitutional commonwealth, uh, which means that the responsibility for a lot of things fall in the lowest form of government. So here in our county, we have 60 municipalities, which means that each municipality is entitled to its own police department, its own fire department, et cetera. So when we have to plan for an event at, for example, Peach Bottom Atomic Power Station, the county, you would think has a uh, this massive responsibility and we do but at the end of the day the key decisions are made by these small individual municipalities so we manage the equipment on their behalf because we have career staff uh, but it becomes very difficult to manage whose equipment is where at what time managing when maintenance is due all of those things and rad responder absolutely helps out with that with where equipment is located or even if it's um, not pre-distributed which equipment is designated uh, to go to what locations, and then keeping track of maintenance and scheduling. And we're also beginning to use it for a lot of pre-planning uh, for things like community reception centers, uh, so we can get uh, floor plans in place, we can get guidance, in fact, we can take the plan and upload it as a document, so someone on the map can, with the right permissions, can say, I'm going to be working at this community reception center, and they'll be able to pull up those details. Uh, we also uh, use it operationally, primarily the HAZMAT team at this point, although tomorrow night we will be doing, for those that have a power plant uh, in their jurisdiction, we'll be demonstrating backup route alerting using RAD Responder uh, tomorrow evening. So uh, if this would be Friday, we could tell you how it went, but uh, we're pretty excited to demonstrate that. But this allows us on the operational realm to do real-time tracking of who, what, when, where, and with what equipment. And we'll have some examples here in some upcoming slides, but we're not only able to say who's on a team, but what equipment they're using, when they took the reading, where they were, when that equip all the metadata, when that equipment was last maintenance, was it operationally checked before use? We're able to track a lot of that stuff. And even on some of the smaller incidents, like spill control calls, where you have a, a tractor trailer that has left a four mile leak of whatever, we're able to utilize that to take uh, geolocated photo logs. So we can have a bunch of people go out, take photographs of different intersections, which has actually helped us out in the courtroom uh, or help us avoid the courtroom because when people find out that you have, you know, very well organized evidence, they typically just say, well, we submit, it's our fault, we'll pay the bill type stuff. And also it allows us to do real-time data sharing with partner agencies, unfortunately, uh, I wish we could have more of the, the Iowa approach. I think that'd be easier to manage. But in our case, uh, we do have a bunch of partnerships to manage, uh, which works out very well if you're able to get all of those partners trained. And so we've kind of taken a stance. We're working on getting some of our neighboring hazmat teams up and running uh, and trying to get those folks more, more comfortable using RAD Responder. And it only is going to make the team collectively better over time. So the first example I'll show you is a radiological dispersal drill, uh, which we ran 
uh, I want to say in December of 2019. So here's some of the data that's collected. And if when you log into the dashboard, uh, this is the first thing that you see when you log into an event. Uh, and it'll tell you what is the total amount of data. And if it's a multi-day event, what data is fresh? What has been taken in the last 24 hours? So this scenario, uh, to give you just some context, uh, where the where the tip of the triangle is, or the pie wedge is, that's actually behind the high school stadium, uh, one of the local high schools. And so the scenario was reported that there had been an explosion, uh, there were a lot of injuries, but the first inclination that this was a radiological event occurred as the first victims were arriving at the hospital, setting off the portal monitors at the hospital, which allowed us to work through uh, the first 100 minutes uh, response plan to get our hazmat team engaged in the map and measure uh, task. And so we were able to send out field teams. Uh, they were able to confirm, well, simulated confirm on two meters that there was in fact a release. Then we were able to add this 10 point monitoring plan, determine its width by that blue line there, and then monitor out. We did adjust it for size so that it would wind up all on public access roads. Uh, because people get a little uncomfortable and the hazmat team just shows up on your property, you know, at eight o'clock at night. <clears throat> but you can see uh, how uh, down the middle line, the readings were a little bit higher and you can see how they get less and less as they space out. And if you go to the next slide, we'll include what the uh, leadership was able to see in real time. You can see them depart the staging area, which is actually in the top underneath where it says Spooky Nook Sports. And we were able to watch both teams uh, as they were responding to their assignments. Uh, we did do some of these via assignment where we would use the system to basically send an alert to their phone and say, you're wanted here. And in other cases, we were just telling them where to go based on uh, either GPS or street intersections. And that was a good practice for utilizing it for both things. But this did allow us, we collected approximately 100 some points of data with two field teams uh, in a little under an hour, including drive time. Uh, and then they returned to the station when they were complete, presumably uh, in a real world event to be uh, decontaminated and assessed themselves, which would create more data points. So some key policies for success, if you're going to use this regularly, uh, which we'll talk about that more in a little bit, is to have a naming convention for your events. And this is our updated one. In fact, as you look through some of the slides here, you'll notice we used to do day-day, uh, month spelled out, and then the year. So, for example, today would be the 2-2-APR-2021, uh, two, 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 and then the name. The problem we didn't think about is that works great for the first you know, month, and then after that, things begin to log uh, <laughs> over and over again, because obviously every month has a first. Uh, so we looked at our data and said we can do better. So now all of them start out with LANC so that it's easy to find uh, in the search log. And then the year followed by the two digit month, followed by the day, followed by the name. And that helps our people find events much quicker uh, because that's not, oh, not every event is a true emergency. So it's not bright red uh, for you. Another thing that we did, uh, we have just shy of a thousand pieces of equipment entered into Rad Responder, uh, and I will uh, agree with uh, my previous, I think it was Miss Leek, I apologize if I butchered your name, um, that working with the folks at Chainbridge to upload from spreadsheets is absolutely the way to go. Uh, we ran into some trouble actually just a week or so ago, and they were able to help us work through it. But uh, if you look at these pictures here, you'll see a small RR number on each of the probes and on the meter, and that allows for efficiency in the field that people don't have to type in the entire serial number to find it. If they are using this particular kit, they would, when they select equipment, they can type in L29 for Ludlum 29, and then they can pick which probe, in this case, the pancake probe, which is P36, or the scintillator, which is P37. And so with all of that equipment, they only ever have to enter three or in some cases four characters. And that process has been repeated on our chemical side as well. Uh, and we've also, wherever possible, tried to make on the newer stuff, the label for chem or rad responder 
visible when you are looking at the screen of the device. And I'll talk about that more for when you're trying to take pictures uh, of the equipment when you are downrange because it would be inconvenient to enter the data. So some of the things that we uh, key policies for success is to use it regularly. We use it for uh, drills or small scale exercises just in-house. We use them on smaller calls. I think I referenced where we go out to even just a spill control call and we're able to collect just observations or readings and just capture them in the same location. What this does is because it's the same interface for both chem responder and rad responder, now Seaburn responder, training in one equals training in both. So even though we don't run a lot of radiological events, although we run probably more than, than most in terms of hazmat teams, uh, People being familiar with the software absolutely helps to get stuff done. Also, when we teach our new folks, our new hazmat techs uh, and our new radiological response team members, when we give out class assignments, they have to turn in those assignments in many cases using RAD or Chem Responder, which forces them from the early onset in our organization that it's something that they need to learn to embrace. If they'd like to pass the class, some of their graded assignments wind up in RAD or Chem Responder. And also, uh, we occasionally get folks to get to take trips either for training or uh, uh, geek sightseeing. Uh, and we've had a few cases where we're able to send uh, set those folks up with and they'll collect data and we'll see that in a moment as well. So uh, we had a gentleman, uh, Darius Allman, who went out to uh, Chernobyl. In fact, uh, he was out there with the, uh, the college. I don't remember, I think it was Idaho. Uh, was out there, and so he and they were able to collect uh, data points while they were there. And interestingly enough, uh, timing-wise, we were able to do some stuff in real time. So we were able to see his readings and his photos in near real time here in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, which really just demonstrates the versatility of this. That it doesn't matter where you are if you've got a if you have an internet connection and a clean view of the sky uh, for your GPS, we can collect data literally anywhere. And so there's some photographs of him uh, collecting, and you can see this two photograph method. When you're in a hot zone or an environment where it's not convenient to enter in all the data, what we're training our folks to do is to basically upload two photographs, one photograph of the area in which they are taking the reading and another photograph of the face of the meter, uh, because at that point you can save your survey and Someone at the command post can update the data based on what they see on the screen, or you'd be able to go back and do it later. And that's the other thing on the metadata side, it will track every change that you made. So it'll say at, let's say 6 p.m. or 1800 hours, you know, Darius Allman took this reading and then at 1900 hours, he went in and made the following changes. Or if I go in, it'll say Ben Herskowitz made those changes. And that's really beneficial if you ever were called to use any of this as evidence that everything is tracked. Okay. So another key thing, if any piece of equipment is identifying its limitations, uh, the two biggest ones that we have found so far is in-suit use. And we kind of told you how we address that uh, with picture taking. We've actually created a smaller app that allows folks to utilize a, we have some intrinsically safe tablets uh, where they just basically, Take, all it does is take the pictures. It may not even enter it into RAD Responder, um, although we are working to get that sorted out. And the other issue we run into uh, as we travel and assist organizations that do not use or not as up to speed with RAD or Chem Responder uh, is what to do with their external equipment. So this is a real world event uh, where they had some found sources and we ran into an issue where our Radiation Protection Bureau came in and they had an account, but they haven't adopted to the same level that we had. So we basically said to the gentleman, if you just take a picture of the back of your meter and a picture of the face, we'll be able to get it entered in at a later time. So this survey started out as an observation. It was just two quick photographs, and then we were able to go back in and enter that data. And even though we have his name, uh, blocked out, you can see that it was collected by, and then later on, uh, I went in and I entered that data on his behalf. We like to think that we're a pretty heavy user because we think this makes our job a whole lot easier on the documentation side. 
and our ability to share stuff in real time with organizations that found source call uh, when we called BRP, uh, we were able to tell them to just log on. We would add them as a partner to the event and they were able to see our readings and then ultimately even some of their own readings uh, in near real time and make a decision on how to bring that event to a positive resolution. So we're gonna transition now to Contra Costa Health Services. Yeah, we're here today representing Contra Costa Health Services Hazardous Materials Programs, which is a hazardous materials regulatory enforcement and emergency response agency located in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. Our agency is considered what is called a Certified Unified Program Agency, or CUPA, which implements six environmental programs at the local level. This includes the California version of the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, also known as EPCRA. Our agency currently permits over 4,000 businesses within the county. We also staff a fully functional Type 1 Hazardous Materials Incident Response Team serving over 1 million residents in Contra Costa County, responding to various levels of hazardous materials incidents from chemical abandonments, transportation accidents, all the way up to large-scale terrorist events. Um, my name is Ellen Dempsey. I'm a hazardous materials specialist with Contra Costa County. I serve as both a hazardous materials compliance inspector and emergency responder. I also serve as the program lead for the hazardous materials business plan, which is the California version of EPCRA, and our stormwater program. Hi, I'm Fallon Zappelli. I'm the hazardous materials technician for our office, and I manage, purchase, and maintain all of our equipment, and also make sure that everything runs smoothly for our incident response team. On the screen is a brief overview of some highlights in Contra Costa Health Services Hazardous Materials Program's adoption of the Seaburn Responder Suite. Seaburn Responder was incorporated for use within our agency to fill an identified gap on how hazardous materials incident response data is collected and shared, even between our own responders. Our hope was to incorporate electronic data management into our response structure to increase efficiency and effectiveness of data sharing in high stress environments. Starting in 2016, Contra Costa Health Services Hazardous Materials Programs began training on the use of RAD Responder through the assistance of our local radiological assistance program, or RAP team, which is out of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. The use of RAD Responder became integrated into our toolbox of technologies for radiological event management, along with the use of triage for reach back. In 2017, our agency became the first to utilize RAD Responder during the Urban Shield exercise, which we'll discuss. We again used RAD Responder to generate a 10-point monitoring plan during the 2018 and final Urban Shield exercise. Also in 2018, our agency became early adopters of the Chem Responder um, specific site during its rollout. Our team was very excited about the potential to use Chem Responder for data management collection um, and interpretation during air monitoring events, which are commonly the type of large-scale hazardous materials events seen in our jurisdiction. In 2019, our agency was able to utilize ChemResponder to collect live air monitoring data during a catastrophic industrial fire and chemical release, which we'll discuss. This was our first technical application and use of ChemResponder during a real life scenario. And finally, and ongoing currently, our agency is involved in a California statewide pilot study looking at the use of Seaburn Responder to modernize data management and create a framework for improved communication during mutual aid events. This program includes a focus on the use of data collected by the Certified Unified Program Agencies and how that information can be more effectively shared to emergency response agencies during large scale events. Urban Shield is a planned training exercise involving local, national, and international first responder agencies. This exercise was managed utilizing the National Incident Management System and incorporates the guiding principles from the National Response Framework to assist tactical teams as well as all first responders to prepare for and provide a unified response to disasters and major emergencies. Hazardous materials teams participate in 12 time-based scenarios which are graded on performance criteria. Scenarios are developed referencing the U.S. Department of Homeland Security core capabilities and the Bay Area Urban Area Security Initiative capabilities based planning for all hazards. Scenarios place emphasis on information sharing, decision making skills, multidiscipline and agency cooperation, and unified effort among first responders and supportive resources at the scene of emergencies. 
Scenarios include chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and explosive events. In recognition of the importance of sharing information and real-time situational awareness among first responders, teams were encouraged to utilize existing and new software, technologies, and equipment designed to provide interoperability and timely situation status and resource status reports. During the 2017 and 2018 exercise, Contra Costa Health Services hazardous materials programs utilized RAD responder during the radiation events. Um, visible on the slide is the data collected and used to generate a 10-point monitoring plan for a radiological dispersal device, as called out in the first 100 minutes guidance published by Department of Homeland Security in 2017. Use of RAD responder during Urban Shield allowed our team to effectively communicate and demonstrate data during the notional RDD event. It also allowed for effective communication for reachback efforts for further radiological source and dispersion analysis. So next we'd like to discuss a real world application in the use of chem responder. In October 2019, two storage tanks at the New Star Shore Terminals facility caught fire and collapsed. Um, our team was responsible for the community air monitoring and issuing or lifting the shelter in place. Um, I was in the emergency operations center and at that time we had just done a big training on chem responder for about half of our team. So I requested that half of the team use chem responder and what they had just learned and the other half just use whatever they had always been using, which is primarily radio and text communication. Um, and then I would be the one in the operations center tracking both and kind of determining which one you know, would work better and whether or not chem responder really is going to make a difference. Um, the difference was immediately apparent. Um, all of the players could get real time access to the readings and it really freed up more time to interpret the readings and um, you know, plan our next locations in the operations center. Uh, in the field, our communications were freed up and um, only essential traffic really was what was going over the radio and through text messaging. Um, and then the other great thing was the responders could see where other teams had been, as well as, you know, what their readings were. Um, at this point, we weren't even using all the features of Chem Responder. Um, if I were to do it again, I would definitely use the assignments feature, which would even further reduce the communications traffic. And it would also help the teams kind of plan their routes um, for where we had requested specific locations to be monitored. Um, the next morning, we had some concerns from our elected officials regarding which neighborhoods were and were not, um, you know, had air monitoring done in them. There were some people from the community that thought that, you know, we had neglected their area and they had felt impacted and um, that we were really, you know, letting them down. Um, and this image right here on the screen is what we use to show them, you know, the locations of our readings and, you know, we had other images that showed the tracking, as you've seen from other slides, from you know which communities, where we were in the communities, what times we had done air monitoring. Um, and we also had another one that showed all of our higher readings and whether or not they exceeded any action levels. Um, and this really kind of gave them peace of mind um, as far as seeing you know, that we did do a good amount in all the different areas equally. Um, and of course, all of this was available live throughout the incident. So at any time, anybody could have said, hey, where have you been? Where have you gone? And we'd be able to bring it up. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, uh, I had only requested half of our team to use Chem Responder, and I had the joy of plotting <laughs> and compiling the data from the other teams that were not on Chem Responder. So that was always uh, fun to do. Um, but definitely after this incident, the responders and those who were in the operations center were committed to using uh, chem responder moving forward just because it saved us a ton of time, um, especially with the data management and um, kind of making quick decisions on the fly really freed up our time. So the ESF 10 coordination project began in 2019 and is currently ongoing. 
ESF or emergency support function 10, oil and hazardous materials response, provides state and federal support in response to actual or potential discharge and or uncontrolled releases of oil or hazardous material. Kelly PA, who is leading this pilot project, oversees the statewide implementation of the Certified Unified Program Agencies, or CUPAs, which my agency is one of. Um, Cal EPA is seeking to modernize its planning and response infrastructure to effectively utilize existing resources, manage the overwhelming amount of information generated during a disaster, and to generate situational awareness of the overall event picture for the state. Um, the re uh, recommended path moving forward using CHEM Responder um, is a statewide ESF-10 coordination and situational awareness tool using a management tool to support mutual aid, local chemical spill response tool for CUPAs and local response agencies without an existing tool, and to modernize the area plan with the use of county emergency operations plans. The area plan program was established in 1986 as a, a planning tool for local government agencies to respond to and minimize the impacts from a release or threat and release of hazardous materials. Mm -hmm. It requires CUPAs to create an area plan that identifies hazardous materials that pose a threat to the community, develop procedures and protocols for emergency response, provide for notification and coordination of emergency response personnel, provide for public safety, including notification and evacuation, establish training for emergency response personnel, identify emergency response supplies and equipment, as well as provide for critique and follow-up after major incidents. Coopers use information collected from the hazardous materials business plan and California accidental release prevention programs to identify hazardous materials in their communities. This information provides the basis for area plan and is used to determine the appropriate level of emergency planning necessary to respond to a release. One of the key goals of the pilot project is to investigate how chem responder could be used to modernize the area plans to be available easily during an emergency response scenario and easily shared with other emergency response agencies. Several CUPAs were selected to take part in this pilot project, including Contra Costa. Just recently, data collected by the pilot CUPAs for high-level chemical storage facilities um, were incorporated into ChemResponder for further analysis of the capability for data sharing between local, regional, and statewide emergency response agencies. Currently, Contra Costa Health Services Hazardous Materials Programs is focused on training our hazardous materials responders on some of the higher-level capabilities of ChemResponder on the web platform. Capabilities such as team management, um, which Fallon had mentioned, and assigning tasks is highly useful during a typical hazardous materials air monitoring event. Our agency is looking forward to a full commitment of implementation of chem responder for all air monitoring events in the near future, as well as the full incorporation of the Seaburn Responder Suite. Thank you very much. Next, I'd like to welcome the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Hi, everyone. My name is Shannon Perry. I'm a radiation control physicist for Connecticut Deep, and I'll be presenting with Mike Bursick, who is the supervising radiation control physicist. I'm going to briefly go over how we've implemented the RAD Responder program within our organization. Um, we use it. We're very heavy users. We pretty much use it every single day. So our primary use is for emergency response in our drills and exercises. However, we also use it for instrument inventory and calibration, our eco gamma program as a procedure library, and recently for decommissioning activities at UNC. So this is our last emergency response drill that we did with Milstone. I took a screenshot of um, the map and zoomed in where our field teams were sent off to take samples. Um, and so I clicked on one of the um, air samples and it pulled up all the information for you to see. Connecticut is home to two operating reactors, uh, Millstone units two and three and two shutdown reactors, Connecticut Yankee and Haddam Neck and Millstone unit one, as well as the electric boat and the uh, Groton Naval subbase. Go ahead, Shannon. Thanks, Mike. And Electric Boat also participates in our emergency response drills as well. So for instrument inventory and calibration, we have over 300 meters, which it's 
quite a few meters to keep track of. So Rad Responder makes it really easy for us to maintain control of the calibration and um, location of our instruments. So I, I have a screenshot, it just is showing you that we have some meters that are coming up for calibration in the next 30 days. Just some more pictures of what that would look like. So most importantly, we are using it as a way to store electronic copies of all our calibration certificates. We do keep hard copies filed in the office, but this is a, a good backup to have. So our Eco Gamma program. Mike, do you want to talk about the Eco Gammas a little bit? Sure. So uh, the Eco Gammas are a device sold by Canberra slash Marion that they're uh, energy compensated uh, GM instruments. They are uh, weather hardened. They are situated outside. We have um, have them in the vicinity of the Millstone Nuclear Power Station right now. And we plan on putting out uh, more. And what they do is they provide us real time data uh, that we access through, we utilize the RAD Responder program to access that data. Okay, so our event that we use for our Eco Gammas is CT RUMS. And as Mike mentioned, we have six um, located currently throughout the state. I have those listed right there, but we wanna focus on installation within the emergency planning zone towns. So we're planning on having several more installed throughout the state. And this is just an example of the data feed location at Harkness Park. Procedure library is pretty self-explanatory. We use Red Responder to file our emergency response procedures. So this makes it easy for anybody to be able to access them quickly um, if they need to do so. So, so this is uh, this was something a little bit different. Um, this is one of those times when you use a device for something that it wasn't intended for. And um, we, we used RAD Responder to input our information on a confirm confirmatory radiological survey we did at the former United Nuclear Corporation nuclear fuel manufacturing site in New Haven. Um, they manufactured fuel for the US Navy from the late 50s until 1974. And um, remediation of the site was not complete until uh, last year. And when we went to do our confirmatory measurements, we utilized RAD Responder to log the data and to uh, to log the data. And, um, you know, what it did, it, it allowed our partners, um, such as uh, other uh, federal partners, the DOE, NRC, or anybody who wanted to take a look at this data, they could look at the, our survey results. Uh, you know, here we, we have example of, uh, you know, the previous slide show, showed an individual scanning. Uh, we, we took uh, soil samples. I think that's what's going on on the left. That's a, uh, a trench near a, what was a, a culvert and um, uh, fixed measurements as well. Here you can see some more pictures of the UNC site. And there you can see where uh, it was, it, the samples were put in, uh, Shen. Yeah, if you go to the next slide, I zoomed in so you can kind of see the different locations we took them. Also, I wanted to mention the indoor monitoring feature. In this case, we didn't use it because there is no longer a building there but it's a very um, good feature to use if you are doing a survey in a building because that way you can do it by room and be able to see where the measurements were taken instead of just being as a cluster on the map at a certain coordinate. And this is just some of our survey results. Um, we have some um, soil scans that we did with an E600, and then it's showing uh, all different soil samples that we took. And here's some of the analytical results. Um, I think they were sent to Tennessee, weren't they, Mike? Yeah, uh, we used a contract lab. We used Teledyne Brown Engineering. 
And, yeah, and uh, so when we got the results back, we had them uploaded into Red Responder. So these pictures actually line up. Um, my laptop screen is very small, so I couldn't get it in one shot. But um, so you can see the results. If anybody wants to, we can give give you the opportunity to look at how we utilize it at UNC. I think it was a little bit um, different. Maybe it is similar to what uh, the previous uh, presentation did with Chem Responder, but um, you know we we used it for actual radiological surveys outside, and we were able to put in um, the analytical data as well, the uh, the radiochemistry analysis, the gamma spectroscopy and uh, results. So, I, I, you know, like I said, it's not something that it was intended to, but it, um, I, I think it was a great tool for us for that. And also it gave us, uh, you know, more practice using RAD Responder. My name is Tim Rice, uh, Battalion Chief with the FDNY. Um, I've been the WMD coordinator now for approximately four years. Um, prior to that, uh, I was sort of in a mentoring role uh, with a couple of senior chiefs that had been working on particularly the Rad Nuke portfolio for a long time, but uh, they were some of the kind of the pioneers of, uh, I guess, our hazmat uh, operations and hazmat response units. Um, so in my role as WMD coordinator, uh, I primarily um, keep one foot in the counterterrorism space uh, for emerging threats and stuff, but, but most of my time is spent uh, doing interagency coordinating uh, with plans, uh, meetings, and exercises, um, as well as special events and then some uh lower lower probability higher risk events such as the rad nuke incidents uh and intentional acts you know like chemical attacks and such so uh i just wanted to talk briefly about um how we got to where we are and some of this is a repetition it sounds like a lot of the a lot of the early adopters uh kind of went about it the same way that we did um as i mentioned i was uh mentoring with a couple of people who had been on this this particular topic of data sharing since about the late 90s um, and they had been searching for these solutions where you know the real-time information could be shared uh, not just with our own agency but among other agencies we we realized early on that you know these are multi-agency incidents uh, that require a much bigger response certainly with the development of the national response framework <laughs> we've now realized quite how big uh, this response eventually would be should we have a rat or a nuke incident. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, we had been looking for a solution for a while and somewhere in the mid 2000s, uh, there were some small startup tech companies that had tried a few different things, but nothing um, ever really performed as advertised, so to speak. Um, so uh, needless to say, we were a little bit skeptical uh, when we first were introduced to RAD Responder. So um, we did have the opportunity to meet with some of the senior leadership from the C FEMA Seaburn office, as well as uh, Chambridge personnel and uh, developers. So that was probably in the spring of 2016 or so. Um, and we brought it back uh, and talked about it, not just with our agency, but some of the other city agencies. Um, and we, as we started to think about it, you know, it couldn't hurt to try it. It was a zero cost thing, you know, basically a free solution that we had thrown money at, at already. Um, and it was being sponsored by FEMA, so it couldn't hurt to try it out. So basically that's what happened. Uh, and we first piloted it at the UN General Assembly, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. It's a roughly week to a week and a half long annual event where leaders from all over the world come in. So we typically have a fairly robust hazmat presence uh, as well as dozens of other uh, local, uh, state, and federal agencies. So uh, we initially uh, asked our personnel to go out and just take background readings, which they did. And uh, I believe over the course of the event, we had over 200 readings, uh, and they were revisiting the same areas of the frozen zone around the UN. 
Uh, and that started to form some of the concept of operations of how we would employ uh, Rad Responder as a response tool. Um, you know, a lot of the technology that does cross our uh, desks or field of view um, are nice to have, but I think we quickly realized that um, this wasn't just a nice to have um, technology uh, piece, that it, it was in fact a response tool for first responders. Uh, and so I think that was kind of the breakover point where we started buying in um, and started to using it more frequently. Uh, so with that, we developed our concept of operations. And one of the challenges that we have you know, frequently for the FDNY, um, people talk about how large we are, how many units we are, and, and how much capability we do have. Um, but some of the problems that we experience are, are just because of that, problems of scale. So we had to really drill down into who would be responding to these incidents initially, which is, you know, any field unit, but who would be coming in really to start to characterize the scene for the radiological threat. Um, so we focused on our hazmat units that were already um, well trained in rad detection and started piloting it um, in, in basically daily um, equipment checks that occur in the firehouses. They check everything from their saws uh, to their uh, AED. We included rad responder login as part of that and we did that for a few months. Um, and then we started taking a background reading just around the firehouses and really started to get that uh, buttonology and muscle memory um, out into our folks' hands. Um, so once we, we basically came up with that CONOP, we had the opportunity to do a demonstration along with uh, the very large exercise Gotham Shield. Uh, that was the FEMA Region 2 uh, IND detonation. Um, and in the next few slides, you'll see uh, just how many agencies were involved. I think we were one of the few agencies that were actually really putting in live data into that. Uh, so yeah, so this slide is basically just, uh, this was our first pilot, and this was just a small time stamp of one day. But you can see we, we just covered the frozen zone around the UN. Uh, and we're able to do that. So we demonstrated for our incident commanders and senior chiefs that uh, we could be out there doing the background. And if there were an incident, we could quickly respond and confirm or refute that there was a RAD, um, RAD component to the incident. So uh, as you can see here, I had to zoom significantly out, um, but this was the real-time readings of the Gotham Shield event. Um, if you were to go into the event, obviously we there were a whole bunch of laters, there were a whole bunch of um, models and guidance documents that were developed as part of Gotham Shield. But this is, uh, this is the bread and butter for someone in my position, certainly uh, an incident commander, this is the view that we need. Um, so, we focus primarily on the map and we use those layers to kind of guide where to direct our personnel. Um, so as I mentioned, we've been doing this now since 2017. Um, we have approximately 44 special events in New York City annually. Um, I'd say roughly about half of those, we deploy hazmat resources to those events um, and then the other half, we periodically will just take background readings uh, around the firehouse. And again, that's a little situational awareness, but also that muscle memory piece. Um, so uh, like I mentioned for, for Gotham Shield, uh, there this is approximately, I believe this is just about everybody that was represented uh, in the New York City Emergency Management um, uh, operations center for that event. Uh, so of all these agencies, you know, there were numerous players. So I think the number, the head count was about 180 people that were viewing this event either from OEM or from their home agency or from their home EOC. So, um, you know, that capability really kind of um, opened everyone's eyes to the to the possibilities, not just with RAD Responder, but going forward then 
uh, chem responder, and certainly now uh, seaburn responder. So that's uh, one of those things that um, we didn't, not everyone really realized there was a need perhaps, but I think Gotham Shield certainly demonstrated that uh, no matter where you are in the country or agency, you can have situational awareness before you ever leave uh, your home station. Uh, and certainly an event of this magnitude, like I said earlier, people would be coming from all over. Uh, so uh, not to go go on too long about this, but um, as I mentioned, we've been using it for a significant amount of time. Uh, I was actually very excited to hear our friends in Connecticut on the call. Uh, we have been in contact with them regarding the use of the eco gammas, um, which is one pilot program that we've initiated with uh, the New York City Department of Health. So there are our primary, uh, one of our primary partners, which also includes the Office of Emergency Management uh, and NYPD. We frequently include them in all of our special event planning and response. So with that, we will now jump jump into a little Seaburn Responder demo. So we'll go over the very high level features of actually getting into the site. So starting with the pre-login pages, how to request an account if you don't already have one. Once you log in, what those post-login pages look like for Seaburn Responder and the hazard specific sites of Rad Responder and Chem Responder. We'll go over the organization space, the event space, and the event map, and then we'll wrap up our overview demo with some resource library tips and tricks. So the pre-login hazard-specific sites for RAD Responder and Chem Responder will show you hazard-specific technical enhancements, upcoming features, the Twitter feed, and the most recent community initiatives. It will also include our schedule of our upcoming webinars with the link to sign up for those webinars, as well as the ability to request a remote training. And so we do offer free trainings for any of our RAD responder or chem responder users. So we highly recommend that you utilize this training request form if you are interested. So the pre-login page provides you with information on each of the facets of the Seaburn Responder Network. So we have RAD Responder here, the future Bioresponder Network, which as Brendan mentioned earlier today is coming later this year. Chem Responder, which was launched in 2018. And also just the Seaburn Responder overview on what the sort of umbrella program is. From this page, you can request access to create an account, and you can also sign in if you already have a pre-existing RAD responder or chem responder account. You can request access and sign in from the top ribbon, and right here I'm clicking request an account. I'll agree to those terms of use, and I'm now brought to the request form. I'll fill out all of those required fields and choose an organization. So I can choose from an organization that already exists, or I can request to create my own organization. I do need to choose a sponsor, so FEMA Seaburn Office will be someone that will say that my organization deserves to be in RAD Responder, we're a legitimate organization, and then you'll submit your request. Account approvals are a two-step process, so first the request will either go to the sponsor or the organization administrator, They'll review your request, and if they approve it, it then goes to the Seaburn Responder team, and we'll do a final check, one, to make sure you're using a valid email address, ensuring that you don't already have an account and you're creating a duplicate account, and to ensure that you're legally employed with your organization. The post-login pages for each of the hazard-specific sites are optimized depending on which site you access. So this is after I've logged into RAD Responder. I can see on the left-hand side, it's telling me how many users are in RAD Responder, how many organizations, information about the RAD Responder Ready program. Also, you'll see that there are some tiles for quick links for your favorite resources. 
some maps and if you toggle on the other map options it will show you the RAP regions, EPA regions, and FEMA regions. Also some quick links to the ROS and as well as some planning and operational guidance tools. You'll see the ChemResponder post login homepage looks similar, but there are some differences here. So again, if there were any um, recent events, you could access them here, as well as some different resources and operational guidance. If you had any recent SIT reps or any hazmat incident database, you could utilize that chemical shortcuts tile as well. This right here is the Seaburn Responder Post Login page. So this is that all hazards tool. And so the Seaburn Responder Post Login page is optimized for a one-stop shop for all hazard resources as part of the Seaburn Responder suite. You'll see on the left-hand side, there are links to the RAD Responder, Chem Responder, Future Bioresponder, and Future IMAC portal pages. So you could always navigate there as well. We do have some support information on that tile, a list of all active events on an event map, the network status, and if you scroll down, there are some additional resources such as ROS and COS, which is the Chemical Operations Support Specialist, which is coming soon. In the Seaburn Responder, everyone needs to be a member of at least one organization. And so organizations can either be a US-based federal, state, local, tribal, or territorial emergency response organizations. It could also include hospitals, universities, equipment manufacturers. Right here on my left-hand side is a quick link to different assets of my organization that I may access regularly. So accessing partnerships, personnel, equipment, and my facilities. Once I'm in my organization space, which is on the right-hand side here, I am brought with my organization dashboard. So the organization dashboard has quick links to pending account request, equipment with your maintenance coming due, which um, Connecticut showed us a little earlier, some of our recent data that was collected across all of our organization's personnel and events, and the total data breakdown. If I go to my details page, it will show me all the information, the different hazard types that I have enabled for my organization. Partnership is, is going to show me the organizations that my organization shares information with. So you can see that there's data shared by my partner and data that I'm sharing. And I can also request a partnership if I have the proper role. This is my personnel list. I can click this button to see all of the different organization roles and what they entail and the different permissions that are granted if someone has that role. These roles and privileges can be customized. My equipment page is going to show a list of all of my radiological and chemical equipment for my organization. If I open the details of a piece of equipment, I can see any maintenance that was performed um, and any information on that equipment. My facilities list is here as well. I can create standing field teams to copy over to events. I can create several different threshold ranges depending on different event types. And I can also set my organization assessment policy here. So as you can see, there are a lot of things that are customizable for your organization. So, um, it's highly recommended, and this is something that Angela Lee from Iowa mentioned, but to really set up your organization ahead of time so that way when there is an emergency response event, you don't have to worry about going in and entering your equipment because it's already there. The event space is going to look similar to the organization space, except this is for a single incident or a single event. So all data that is entered into Seaburn Responder needs to be associated with an event. Events can be classified as an emergency response, a non-emergency operation, testing and training, routine monitoring, or a special event. You'll see here on the left-hand side for those post login pages for Chem Responder and Rad Responder, there is a quick link event tile where you can search for and create an event. Once you're brought to that event space, this dashboard looks very similar to that organization dashboard, except again, this is for that single event. You can enter your data into these events either via the website, via the mobile application, or through equipment APIs. 
The event dashboard will show me any field teams, assignments that I have that are pending, as well as the data. This is where I'll record my data if I am not using the mobile app. The data section here is going to separate my data into different tables, so my surveys, chemical IDs, etc. The configuration section is where I can set the details and parameters for my event. I can choose assessment delegates and assessment policies for my event. If I have any GIS files, I can upload them and manage them here, as well as event-specific partners and responders. I can create event field teams that could be mixed across all responders on the event, not just my organization. There's also data collection assignments, which will send notifications to users that they need to go and collect data at a particular location. Lab analysis, if this is something, if you're collecting samples, you can utilize the lab analysis feature. And lastly, we have reports. So Seaburn Responder can generate automatic reports such as event summary report, a field team report, dosimetry report, and you can also print barcodes directly from Seaburn Responder for your samples. Each event has a document library where you can upload images, documents, um, videos, presentations for everyone on the event to be able to access and download and reference. The record data screen on the left hand side is via the website and this is where I can choose the data point I want to enter. And on the right hand side you'll see that it looks very similar but this is on the mobile application. And so depending on the hazard types that you have enabled for your event, you will see those respective data types available. So here, this is a RAD and CHEM event. So I'm seeing radiological data types such as surveys and samples and radiological spectra, as well as CHEM data types such as chemical sit reps, chemical IDs, chemical spectra. On the right-hand side, this is a CHEM-only event. So I'm only seeing those chemical-specific data points here. So I'm seeing chemical sit reps, chemical IDs, chemical readings. Data sets and observations are hazard agnostic, so they are available for any type of event. Once data is entered, you can view the data via the data tables, or you can view them geospatially via the event map. And so this right here is my data table for my survey data type. I can sort by severity level, I can sort by the collected date and time, I can also filter to show data only collected by a particular individual or a particular field team. Via the event map is where I'm going to see my data geospatially. So every event in Seaburn Responder has a corresponding event map. The map plots the location of each data point so you can go in to see where that data was recorded. If I click a data point, it will give me the details and I can see more information on the right hand side here such as the assessment information, any indoor monitoring floor plans or any attachments. If I click on a cluster, which a cluster is data points that are very closely together, I can expand it to see each of those individual readings. I can also upload my own GIS files or once the iMac portal is released, you can have iMac push models directly to your event. You can see here, this is my overlay and I can click on any of the layers for more information. User drawing tools is going to be a great way to indicate your own sections, critical infrastructure, or other points that you want to identify on the map. You'll click begin drawing, use your drawing tools. Um, anytime you click a point for a polygon, it drops a vertice and you can see now I have my polygon. I'll save it and name it. And once I save my drawing, I can actually click on the drawing and it will show me some information inside that drawing. So it shows me that I have 50 surveys in that drawing. And it will also show me the highest reading, the lowest reading, any other information that's available. The map is very robust. There are a ton of icons and symbols, and so this is the symbology tab here, which will be a great key when you're looking through the event map to understand what each icon is referring to.
The map can be customized to show as much or as little information as you would like. So if I turn off the user collected data layer, all of my data points are going to be hidden. Um, and I can customize this by toggling on and off different layers to see what I want to see. There are also filters that work very similarly on the event map as they do in the data tables. And so I can see, I can choose to only see data collected by a particular individual, um, only see gamma readings. Um, it's very customizable. Another resource is the resource library. And so on the post login homepages, you can see any resources that you favorited or resources that you access very frequently under this favorite resources tile. And so this is going to be a great thing for you to utilize if you frequently access the Rad Responder Ready folder, the special feature webinars, user manuals, and job aids. You can also access the resource library from the top ribbon of your homepage by clicking down on resources and then opening resource library. I'll just highlight some of the two most useful features in the resource library, and that will be the documents library and the video library. The documents library has all information about our drills, rad responder ready, future chem responder ready, train the trainer, etc. But the most important, in my opinion, will be the user manuals and job aids folder. Once you open that folder, you can choose whether you want job aids on data, events, labs, the mobile apps, or your organization. And from there, there is a walkthrough step-by-step -step job aid on how to utilize every feature in Seaburn Responder. Twice a month, we conduct feature-based special feature and bonus webinars, and those are always recorded and uploaded and then posted to our Seaburn Responder resource library, as well as on our YouTube page and is then shared on our social media platforms. I'm now going to hand it over to my colleague, Megan, who will go over some Rad Responder specific highlights. Thank you, Christine. Again, I'm Megan Callen, and I am a program analyst and a quality assurance analyst for the Seaburn Responder team here at Chambridge Technologies. I'm going to be highlighting some Rad Responder specific um, information about our website. So, as mentioned a few times throughout the presentation, depending on the hazard types you have enabled for your event, you may see different data types. So if you have radiological hazard types enabled, you will see the following radiological data types. These include surveys, samples, analytical results, radiological spectra, observations, dosimetry, and mobile surveys. I'll now briefly go over each of these data types and give a little more information on them. So for surveys, you can enter the reading details and associate them with any meters or probes used to collect the reading. The sample data type allows you to enter various different samples that I have outlined in the bottom left of the screen. So you have about 10 different sample types you can pick from. You can then add further information such as contact dose rates, contamination checks, and field screenings. The sample data type then allows you to associate these samples with analytical results. So you associate those off of the barcode. These records are then used to track the results of the sample as it comes in from the lab. The radiological spectra data type allows you to record isotopes, confidence levels, and add exposure rates. You can also associate data or configuration files, and our website will then parse these files to fill in any applicable fields. The observation data type allows you to record a brief description of anything you want to make note of. You can add attachments to the observation data type as well as all other data types. And as Ben from Lancaster County mentioned, they utilize the observation feature as a way to just take a quick photo, maybe record a quick description of their location, 
And then at a later point, they can upload further metadata about this. The dose reading data type allows you to record the radiation type as well as the dose entry method that you used. Our website will then calculate the individual readings and combine them into an accumulated dose reading for each individual responder. The mobile survey data type allows you to record reading paths from an equipment item in motion. These readings are submitted via equipment API. I know Brendan touched on this briefly at the beginning, but you can use these to calculate a drone's flying path as it collects readings or a vehicle that is recording readings as it's driving or a person walking with a backpack that is collecting readings. So you can use this for many different um, reading paths. So those were the radiological specific data types. I'm now going to highlight some of the lab features that we have. So as part of the RAD Responder website, we have a lab access portal, which I have highlighted in red there. And this provides a way for laboratories to access RAD Responder and view the analysis requests that have been submitted to them. They can also download data reporting templates and upload any data packages. So Rab Responder also contains laboratory features that can be used on the user side to communicate with the laboratories. The non-conformance forms are used to communicate information related to any type of problem with the sample that may prevent it from progressing the, in the workflow. The non-conformance form will place the sample on hold until someone goes into the form and resolves the issue or deems a sample as not usable. You can also create mixtures that can be then used for the analysis request. These mixtures can be created from an uh, exi existing template or can be created completely from scratch. And these will define the analytical requirements for the analysis request form. So this will provide the labs with more in-depth information on the requirements you're looking for. The analysis request form is um, probably the most important of this lab process. This will indicate what samples are being shipped to the laboratory for analysis, what the analytics of, the interest, of interest are, and any other special instructions um, you want the lab to know about. This form is available as soon as your samples are shipped in the system, and the lab can then view this form to prepare and receive the samples. Also, part of the analysis request, you can download a comprehensive analysis request report, and this will contain contact information, shipping information, the samples, results, and the chain of custody form. The message board provides a means to document any communications between the laboratory and the user. So if there's any issues that arise or anything you want to get across, you can use this feature here. So now Christine briefly went over the map features. So I'll touch on two different types of scenarios, the first being a nuclear power plant scenario. So if your event is a nuclear power plant scenario, you will have these options available on the event map. So here you can see there are two layer options, one being a 10 mile and one being a 50 mile. These will be enabled by default when you navigate to the map. And then you can toggle on both, none, or one of these layers. So if you wanted to get kind of a closer look of the area around the release point, you can leave the 10 mile layer on. And then on the other hand, if you wanted kind of, of a bigger picture um, image, you could turn on the 50 mile layer. 
You can also enable GIS files that we have on our site that contain nuclear power plant locations from different regions. So you can enable them for an entire region or if you wanted to just view specific nuclear power plants that are um, important to the ones that you're viewing, you can select just those. And similar to the nuclear power plant scenario, the radiological dispersion device features will also be enabled on your map. On the map, these options are called the 10-point monitoring options. I will make a note that the 10-point plan and the transect are present on every event, no matter the scenario, but the shelter in place and the hot zone are specific to RDD scenarios. You can edit the 10-point monitoring plan at any point. You can change the wind direction, which will alter the way the plan is facing, as well as adjusting the scale to make it larger or smaller. The other features of the RDD scenario include the transect, which is used to establish if there's a long range contamination and gather any information about high, the highest concentration points. The initial hot zone is that darker yellow circle, which is around the release point, And that shows 250 meters in all directions from the release point. So that is definitely a zone that general public wants to stay out of and only first responders go in there as it says, to conduct life-saving rescue operations. The shelter in place zone is the area that the general public should remain inside for, so pretty straightforward, the shelter in place. So as Christine mentioned, we have the resource library that contains some tools. The RADNUC decon tool can take you through some overall response strategy steps so you can go through the process open up any of the information icons and they'll provide you with more specific instructions so you can customize this to your scenario um, here you can see i'm adding specific event types and removing specific radionucleotides so it's pretty customizable um, and fairly quick to get through, which is is always good in a in a response situation. And as outlined at the beginning, um, kind of the description, this is doesn't provide a definitive solution. It's giving you some response strategies. So um, at the end, you'll provide it with the results, and you can download a report of it. So in addition to the resource library, we have the public information resource library. This is available to non-users of CBRIM responders, so to the general public. They can access this without having an account. They have the same type of resources, tools, documents, videos, and training. You can find fact sheets on here that are available for download. So again, this is available before logging in, so pre-authentication. So if you do not have an account, you can still access these among with other resources that are available. And those highlight some of the RAD responder features that are most used. I'm now gonna hand it over to Sean Doling to highlight some chem responder features. Um, we're gonna at least give you a flavor for some of the features that um, you can benefit from in, in chem responder. Uh, of course, this will be kind of a mile wide inch deep, uh, but it will at least provide you some exposure uh, to the different data types we have uh, and some of the marquee features that are specific to the chemical hazard portal. I think this will be helpful for everyone. So 
So right now in, in production, we've got five data types that you're seeing on screen there. We have a 6-1 coming in chemical sample form uh, that we're working on presently, and that's going to come out in May. Uh, but I'll touch on the chemical reading data type, the chemical ID, the spectrum, and the color metric reading, and the chemical sit rep. So the chemical reading data type uh, I would use for typically multi-gas meter readings uh, or other chemical sensors that I might have in the field. So on the left side screenshot, uh, we see the users um, add, is using a photoionization detector here at PID. Um, they're capturing just a single sensor reading. Uh, on the right side, they're selecting a multi-gas meter they're using in their event. Uh, and they're entering uh, an array of measurements that they're collecting off of the different sensors on board the multi-gas. So you can enter those, uh, as you see here, as an array of sensors and, and readings for each of them. The chemical ID data type is quite straightforward. Uh, here I'm just selecting a chemical and entering its concentration. So here I've got a VOC, I'm entering uh, 3.4 parts per million, uh, again, from just a, a PID. The chemical spectrum data type uh, lets you enter uh, substance description for whatever it is that you're analyzing, any chemicals that are identified in their respective confidence levels that your uh, instrument is reporting back to you. This data type will let you enter all that information um, if you've got data files, spectra files that are coming off of the spectroscopic equipment you're using in the field, um, ChemResponder also uh, will allow you to upload that data file, like you can see there on the right image. Um, so we've had feedback from organizations, even manufacturers uh, of the detection equipment that they can see a lot of utility in almost using ChemResponder as sort of a waypoint to be able to ferry um, the file back for reachback support, whether that's from the manufacturer themselves or um, some other analyst that is able to download the file uh, and throw it into uh, some sort of other, other analytical software that might be using to identify uh, the chemicals uh, of concern here. Color metric reading, I can choose uh, from different test types here uh, and input my results, so different paper tests in this case. So in this example, we've uh, selected a pH strip and, and entered the value there. The chemical SITREP data type is unique in that it can be created either from outside um, an event or within events. So this data type was originally conceived uh, based on some feedback we got from some hazmat teams who wanted a way to be able to log some response information for calls or responses that might not warrant the creation of a full-fledged event. They might not need to avail themselves of, again, all the sharing functionality and everything that the event space offers. But they asked for just kind of a simple form they could use to, again, record things like, you know, weather information, of course, chemicals that were identified, you know, impact to the public, any medical impact, um, uh, patients who might have been evaluated, uh, and any kind of narrative or summary of the response. So that's what the SITREP form offers um, uh, to users. So you can, again, create these from the mobile application. Um, you can create them outside of any event context or, or with any events that you've got. So Chief Rice touched on some Tier 2 um, functionality here uh, during his talk. And so here, what we're showing is that uh, we've created organizations, or excuse me, we've created, added facilities at the organization level, and the user has navigated into details for one of those facilities. And we can see here how we can add chemicals um, to the facility, sort of a chemical inventory here, and display, store, share, all kinds of typical tier two information that you'd see, like the maximum amount of the chemicals stored, how many days on site, um, other things we can store at the facility level, floor plans, documents, if you've got area plans or emergency response plans, we can store those here. Points of contact, of course, owner operators for the facility, emergency contacts, um, all valuable stuff. 
uh, that you'd want to be able to retrieve quickly, of course, if you're dealing with a facility incident. Um, so again, you know, we were really trying to build out this capability in Chem Responder, the, um, this idea of being able to effectively store and share uh, the large volume tier two information that a lot of fire departments, of course, you know, are, are having to contend with. Uh, we want Chem Responder to be a useful asset for them uh, in being able to manage and share that information. A bit more on facilities. So here we are displaying a facility on one of our event maps. So the user's clicking on the facility icon and opening details there. So all that information we just saw that the, on the other page, we can view here right on the event map too, uh, including the, the chemical inventory at that site. Uh, we've also got a floor plans capability. Uh, and so here the user is navigating to floor plans that are saved at this facility and is choosing to view data for one of the indoor floor plans. And so you can see instead of that geographical map we we're looking at before, now we have an indoor floor plan image. All the features that are at your disposal, you know, in the sort of typical map, if you will, are available here for you too on the indoor space. So drawing tools, um, all the data types that we've talked about. Uh, this is true not just of the chemical hazard portal, I should say, you RAD responder users can use this feature as well, the indoor collection feature. Um, so it's cross hazard. Um, and uh, again, users can upload uh, image files, you know, if you got JPEGs uh, or PDFs, um, any of those kind of standard file types, you can upload as floor plan images and uh, again, view and add data from this indoor floor plan view. So uh, this is a, a really nice feature that we've been excited about. Uh, we just made some some enhancements a few months ago that were released to production. So check that out. Lessons learned and the hazmat incident database. So um, again, feature that was requested by a lot of organizations. We got feedback from for V1 Chem Responder requirements. The ability to create lessons learned, save them at the organization level, share them with partners. So Looking at details here for lesson learned we created, we see you know there are chemicals identified here, chlorine dioxide. We've got different attachments, you know, after action reports, images, of course, the lesson learned description itself. Um, any of these lessons learned you create, you can hide from the hazmat incident database, which we're going to navigate to now. Um, here our hazmat incident database uh, is at the in the resource library. Um, so um, this user is going in and searching, entering a query in this database, um, looking for chlorine dioxide and searching across SITREPs events and lessons learned that uh, are gonna meet the criteria for these search parameters they're entering. So they're entering a chemical, they're entering a location and specifying you know, basically 20 mile radius from this location I identify, return for me all the SITREPs events and lessons learned that Again, meet those criteria. So again, this is the requirements for this were based on some some feedback that we got from folks as we were writing um, the first version requirements for Chem Responder, which was, you know, we'd like to be able to benefit from lessons learned that not just my partners are saving in Chem Responder, but um, other organizations that might be all the way across the country are uploading into the site, and if they're willing to share, you know, those lessons learned in this database um, and you know uh, particularly for some of the kind of the niche responses we might be engaging in chemicals we don't contend with often um, if they've got you know resources and lessons learned that we can we can um, uh, benefit from I'd like to be able to see those things so that's that's one application here another one is um, you know uh, actually you know chief rice when he was talking earlier he kind of talked us through a couple scenarios again as we were writing requirements for the system where you know they get questions sometimes from like the health department in new york city for instance you know something like you know we've got some public health concerns over in the section of the city maybe you know a cancer cluster something to that effect um can you tell us you know how many like how many hazmat calls uh have you made uh to you know x y and z blocks in the city over the past year or two uh, and you know, initially, they didn't really have a simple way to answer a question like that one. So with the hazmat incident database, we wanted to give end users the ability to answer a question like that, where again, as you saw, I can specify a location. And if I want to know again, how many events, how many sit reps have we logged in this geography over 
X period of time, again, I can enter a date range if I'd like to. Um, it'll return all that for me uh, in the query results like you see here. So um, again, this is still in its version one capability. Uh, get in there and, and mess around with it. And if you got feedback for us, we'd love to hear it. Um, so uh, that brings us to the conclusion here of the, the chem responder portion. Uh, so I will hand it back to Christine for the closeout. You can reach out to us for any questions, comments, feature requests, issues at support at seabrandresponder.net. So our Seaburn Responder support team will get back to you as soon as possible during regular business hours. We also have that 24-7 emergency support hotline that you can find on our contact page. No question or issue is too small, whether that be you need help resetting your password or creating an account, or you need help creating an event and figuring out how to upload files on the event map. We hope you found this training useful and helpful, and if you don't already have a Seaburn Responder account, you're encouraged to sign up for one and play around with it and see if this is a capability you can leverage in your organization. Thank you for joining us for our first Seaburn Responder Nationwide Introductory Training.